In this video, I'll continue talking about Azim Nanji's paper, Beyond the Clash of Civilizations. And I should mention this paper uh, was written in March of 2001. It's actually an extract from an address that was given as part of the 2020 Building the Future lecture series at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And, and the paper can be found online as well. So Azim Nanji goes on to note that, that Islamic civilization uh, did expand. It was actually, you know, after its founding, uh, there was, you know, quite a lot of expansion uh, going on, and, and one interesting thing with the expansion was that it didn't conflict with local cultures, and really, in many ways, Islamic expression, you know, it really permeated. It permeated local cultures, as opposed to kind of conflicting with them. And in many ways, uh, that expression was synthesized into the vernacular or the local languages of those regions, and in doing so. Uh, you know, there were opportunities for, for learning, for, for the arts, for architecture, for music, and for science to really flourish in these societies, but in their vernacular. So, for example, in Iran, uh, the language of expression was Persian. In India, the local Indic languages, and ultimately thereafter Urdu, once uh, the state of Pakistan was founded, um, provided uh, an opportunity for, uh, for further expression in, in local languages. Uh, in areas like Tajikistan and Central Asia, again, local languages were the, the dominant mean uh, through which um, Islamic culture could be expressed. Now, I do want to mention in general, I mean, and, and this should be something that, that most of you probably know, that Arabic really is the, the main language of Islam. It's always been the primary language of Islam. And really, in, in the case of Islam expanding to other regions, Arabic really just served as, uh, in many ways, a common unifying thread, but it was by no means the only language in which expression was permitted. And then Nanji goes on to write, quote, that that frames for us the way in which Islam played a role in bridging relations between existing cultures and what would emerge as the modern West. Colonization and war brought these two into conflict. Much of that conflict now spills over into our time, but for a very long period, Islam served as a cultural bridge and as a transition between the Mediterranean and the growing civilization of the West, which was remarkably reflected in the heritage of Spain, for example." Unquote. And so this, this synthesis of local culture and the Islamic faith really changed significantly, especially in the face of rapid colonization. Okay, and, and this rapid colonization took place around the, uh, the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, and this is rapid colonization uh, by the West, really by European powers, um, of, over many areas, including uh, a majority of the Muslim world. All right, and, and so as European powers took over this majority of the Muslim world, and, and really this ascendancy or rise of the West together with uh, the resulting colonial expansion affected in one way or another really every part of the Muslim world. I mean, the, the effects really did percolate quite widely uh, in this regard. Now, actually, I talked about this notion of rapid colonization in a series of videos I did about uh, Karen Armstrong's book. So she's written a book um, on Islam. And if you look at uh, videos I've done on Karen Armstrong's book, you'll see uh, an extensive discussion of rapid colonization. Okay, and really the interesting thing is that you know this rapid colonization, uh, in in many cases, even after the colonized states gained independence, the world that they were left with, the world that was essentially left behind, was quite fragmented. It was a mess in many ways, and as a result, it was very difficult to put the pieces back together. Now, as, as one case study, Nanji does consider the collapse of the Soviet Union in particular. And the collapse actually had quite a broad-reaching ripple effect. And in particular, it affected former satellites of the Soviet Union, places like Yugoslavia and Albania. And in areas like Bosnia and Kosovo, Nanji writes that, quote, groups have begun to identify themselves in very different ways, and those identities often clash with identities that have a very different appropriation of history. Appropriation of history. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the Muslim presence in these regions is not new. In fact, uh, Muslims have been 
you know, in, in particular in, in the Balkans, and let me kind of write this down, uh, in the Balkans in particular, you know, you've, we've actually had, uh, there's been a Muslim presence uh, since the Ottoman times, okay, so, so since the Ottomans, and that's, uh, you know, we're talking about 500 or so years ago, so it's not a new phenomenon by any stretch of the imagination. And Nanji goes on to write that, quote, so all the clashes, which are a result of finding ways to identify or to define, rather, an identity that is nationalistic, are actually based on much larger identities that had a civilizational framework not an ethnic or national framework. The emergence of ethnic and national identities as a political force is a phenomenon of recent provenance within the Balkans, building again upon different histories which go back centuries. And building again upon different histories which go back centuries. So really, you know, he's really just saying that, you know, we're talking about issues that are, that are quite old and they are quite complex because they, you know, we're talking about trying to enforce or, or uh, and impute a, a national identity uh, on societies that, that may not have, you know, quite had that or, or, or been so willing to accept it in that way, shape, or form. Okay, I'm going to continue talking about this paper in the next video.